Will you um, just stop the video? Mm -hmm. Well, because you're on the screen, I'm on the screen standing up. I think we're all set up, right? Yeah. We're just coming on survey. Check one, two. Thank you. That's kind of how that is. It needs to be muted. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sound, 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 there we go. Sound, 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 sound.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Joe Sheeran, and I have the privilege of being one of the co-pastors here at Woodland Park Presbyterian Church, along with Reverend Stacy Imes. And I also have the privilege today of welcoming you to this hybrid format worship service on the Sunday. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time or first time in a long time in person or on Zoom, we hope that you will feel comfortable and invited to participate in as much or as little as feels good to you. Uh, along those lines, we will be celebrating communion this Sunday as we do every Sunday at Woodland Park Presbyterian Church. If you are joining us on Zoom, uh, it's great to see your smiling faces. Uh, this is your invitation and reminder to have something ready to eat and drink for that part of the service. Uh, one important announcement, we will be having a congregational meeting after worship today. If you are a visitor or a longtime attendee who's just not a member, uh, you are welcome to stay, and you are also welcome to say, this is my cue to, to get out and enjoy the rest of my Sunday. Uh, it'll be a, I hope, a pretty exciting, interesting presentation from our Property with Purpose team, along with just getting some consensus around it. So stick around for that. And before we can... And before we continue with, is there somebody on Zoom? Uh, before we continue with worship, I want to share one last announcement that's part of our, our weekly uh, centering. That's our land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that Woodland Park Presbyterian Church and many of our homes are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people and other peoples. The Duwamish are the first people of Seattle, and they are still here, continuing to honor and bring light to their heritage. We benefit from the theft of their land every day. And as we continue in our time of worship together, one of our traditions born out of the pandemic is using the ASL for peace be with you as part of our exchanging signs of peace. So friends, that's peace be with you. Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Exchange signs of peace with our neighbors. Peace be with you, Fenley. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Judy. Peace be with you, Joy. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Judy. Peace be with you, Joy. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Roger. Peace be with you, Roger. Peace be with you, Carolyn. Peace be with you, Roger. Peace be with you, Karen and Theo. Peace be with you, Carolyn. Join me in the call to worship. We have gathered to worship God. We have come seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and insight. We have come to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst. We have come to offer the, the seasons and the turnings in our lives and to ask God's help in our learning and in our growing.
Join me in the prayer of confession. Living God, growing God, in this time when light recedes from our corner of the world, help us to feel your spirit moving within us. Give us strength as we move through the changes in our lives to be in this moment together. At times we shortchange ourselves, clinging to dear to the past or rushing off to the future, avoiding the now. Help us to be rooted in the present, in the sorrows, joys, challenges, and successes of this season of our lives. Savoring the moment when this year's leaves flash their color brilliantly before making way for next year's. Savoring the present season before it gives ways to the next. Amen. God made us and knows us fully. When we are honest about our true nature before God, our imperfection is part of our perfection in God's eyes. Friends, let us believe the good news of the gospel. In God's grace, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Join me in the prayer for a nation. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. Shown. I'm wearing a mask today when I'm not speaking in front of you out of an abundance of caution. The sound in my throat is the leftover from the virus that I had three weeks ago. <laughs> so I don't think that I would share anything, but just in case I am masking and sanit hand sanitizing a lot today. But forgive me for my, ask your patience with my froggy, froggy voice. I should sing the sermon because it turns out my singing voice is fine. It's the speaking <laughs> voice that's the problem. So in the narrative lectionary this week, we are moving into a new genre, a new kind of biblical text. We're moving from texts that are stories about prophets to texts of prophecy by prophets. The context is the same as where we've been for the last few weeks, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, a now a vassal state to the Assyrian Empire. In these vassal state arrangements, as biblical scholar Margaret O'Dell explains, these allegiances were sealed by treaty oaths in which vassals swore to love their new overlords in exchange for promises of military protection. In these treaties, love was synonymous with loyalty, the proof of which consisted primarily of steep payments of tribute every year to Assyria. Now, for the faithful, this loyalty was considered a great sin. It was considered to be allegiance not just to another king, but to those king's gods. So at this point in the story, the northern kingdom of Israel has now rebelled against paying these steep annual tributes. And they have been and will continue to be brutally punished by the Assyrians for that decision. So in this context, at this point in the story of the Northern Kingdom, Hosea rem reminds the people of God's genuine love and loyalty to them. And Hosea tries to get them to turn to God for help to be, and for that turning to God to be a turn of genuine faith and genuine allegiance. Now, I have to say that as a, fan, as a whole, I am no fan of Hosea. The primary metaphor that Hosea uses to chastise Israel in the first few chapters, which we're not gonna hear today, is horribly misogynistic. I don't believe that it's redeemable. That said, the editors of the narrative lectionary have managed to find these eight verses that I didn't even know existed in Hosea. And while they don't at all excuse or erase the problematic parts of the book, they are very different, beautiful even. So I'm glad we get to hear them today. In the reading we're about to hear, 
Hosea uses the metaphor of God as the loving parent of a rebellious child, Israel. You're going to hear the names Israel and Ephraim. In this context, these names are synonymous. Israel and Ephraim are both names for God's child, Israel. In the reading, God talks about lovingly caring for and raising, nurturing Israel or Ephraim. And then the frustration of watching the child continuously rebel and turn towards other gods, which of course is referencing the times when they've been paying their taxes to Assyria and benefiting from Assyrian protection. Near the end of the reading, you're also going to hear the name of two cities you've probably never heard of before, Adma and Zeboim. The original audience for this text would have recognized those names as two cities that were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. So all that said, let's hear our scripture reading today from Hosea. Our Hebrew Bible reading today is from the 11th chapter of Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. Then they kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities, it consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, O Ram? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. For I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. The stories of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy One, open these texts of prophecy to our ears and our hearts. Help us to be moved, God, so that we can hear how you are living and moving among us today. And may the froggy words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you ever want to get our four-year-old Gus talking, ask him about superheroes. Or more specifically, ask him which superhero he is at the moment. He usually has an answer. He might be Dash from Disney's The Incredibles, like we were for Halloween or the comic book superhero The Flash, which he also was for Halloween, or Super Grover, or Super Elmo, and then there's the ones that you might be less familiar with, Super Kitties, Super Narwhal, Super Wicket, that's our dog, and of course, Super Gus himself. It's not hard to figure out what's feeding this obsession. It seems like two out of three kids shows for his age group are about super someone. And the attraction of superheroes doesn't seem to expire after preschool. Think of all the incredibly popular book series, comic books, television shows, and movies featuring characters with superpowers or magical abilities of one kind or another. 
There's something in us as humans that loves to escape into a world where the existential threats are clear and superhuman power can save the day. Of course, that's not a new phenomenon. Ancient mythology and epic tales and the Bible itself are full of superhuman marvels. Think of last week's story about Elijah challenging, challenging the prophets of Baal. Of course, in that story, it's God who shows up as the superhero. And I think that's what the people in Hosea's context are hoping is going to happen too. They know that they haven't been faithful. And to be fair, they were in an impossible situation. As a small kingdom surrounded by much larger regional powers, it was only a matter of time before they would be pressured to either pay up or be wiped out. So they paid up. From our position in history, looking back, we can see that that's really all that they could do. But based on the worldview and beliefs of the time, that was a terrible betrayal of their faith and a blatant display of disloyalty to their God. So they know that they haven't been faithful, but they're now rebelling against Assyria and hoping that God will swoop in and perform some superhuman marvels, vanquishing their enemies and saving the day. Now, if it seems like I'm being glib or making fun of that expectation, I'm not. It's a totally normal human thing, way back then and even now, to hope that God will just do God's thing and make it all better. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we talk a lot about being made in God's image. But I actually think it's the other way around. I think that as human beings, we create God in the image of ourselves but ourselves as we wish we were, our superhuman selves, the theological and religious version of a superhero. If the deepest fear of the people is being conquered, then it makes sense that they would turn to images and beliefs about God as a superhuman warrior, a conqueror, a king. If the deepest fear of the people is that they will be annihilated, it's understandable that they would speak of a God with the power to destroy, to kill, with just a word. If our deepest fear is that we will be controlled, then it's no wonder that across the course of history, so many have prayed to a God with the power to force our will on our enemies. So it's not surprising that the people in Hosea's time are hoping that God will rescue them with some superhuman feat. Just like it's not surprising when people with incurable disease pray for a cure. It's a totally understandable prayer. And it's only problematic if the prayer isn't answered. This is what's known in theological terms as the problem of theodicy. Basically, if God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, then why do bad things happen? If God is capable of preventing suffering but chooses not to, then what does that say about God? And what does it say about us? Hosea especially the Hosea of the chapters before today's reading, might say this. Well, God made that choice because you're being punished. Or God made that choice because God wants you to learn something from your suffering. Or God made that choice because it will make you stronger. Regardless, there must be an explanation, right? Because if God is all-powerful, then everything has to be a part of God's plan. Now, before I go too far, if I haven't already, 
I want to pause and say that it's not actually a bad thing to trust that there is a plan for our suffering. And if you hold that belief, I'm not trying to take it away from you. I remember learning in chaplaincy training that when patients are able to find meaning in their suffering, and that meaning gives them hope, those patients are happier and they're more likely to thrive, even if they still die from their disease. So if someone is finding meaning in their suffering by saying that it's a part of God's plan and that belief is helpful to them and that belief doesn't hurt anybody else, then great. Unfortunately, though, I've met too many people for whom that's not the case. I've heard too many beautiful, faithful people blaming themselves believing that they must just not be good enough in God's eyes for God to answer their prayers. I've seen too many people with tears in their eyes start to repeat that often quoted platitude that you know someone said to them, I know that God never gives us more than we can handle, but... And we've all heard too many of the horrendous, but sadly too common news stories when these understandings of God are used as justification for violence and other injustices. When the explanation, when the belief isn't helping, when it's actually hurting our relationship with God and one another and ourselves, that's when these superhuman images of God become a problem because they're not saving us anymore. Now, most of us were raised with some kind of superhuman image of God, like I've been talking about. I certainly was. Growing up, I was never promised that God would work miracles in my life or anything like that. But I was raised with these same biblical stories and weekly prayers for God to intervene in our lives to heal or fix or save us in some way. As most of you already know, that understanding of God, that superhuman God who can who can and will protect us if we are faithful enough. For me, that's an image of God that was disrupted too early in life. Most of you already know my story, but for those who don't, I'm a survivor of childhood kidnapping and sexual assault. I know that's a dramatic thing to just throw out there if you're hearing it for the first time. I've preached about it in the past and about my healing process, so I'm not going to say that much about it today, except to say that it took a long time for me to realize how lucky I was because of what the adults in my life at the time didn't say to me. No one, not at church, not at school, not in therapy. No one ever said to me, God has a plan for this, or God doesn't give you more than you can handle. Nothing like that. Or if they did, it didn't stick with me. It wasn't the primary response. Now, I don't think the adults in my life at the time were consciously avoiding that kind of theology. I suspect it was more that what had happened was just so unthinkable to everyone that it never even occurred to them to try to justify it. This all happened when I was 10 years old, and it was a shock not just to me and my family, but to our entire town. And it's not that bad things never happened in our town. They did, and we heard about them. But this incident was particularly shocking. Like most traumas of that kind, it was a trauma for everyone. Now, I'm not trying to downplay the impact on me, but I've only been able to see as an adult how that event broke the illusion of safety for the whole community. And once that kind of illusion is broken, people become much more aware, not just of their own vulnerability, 
but more aware of the true severity of other incidents of unexplainable and undeserved suffering that are happening all the time, all over the world. And while as human beings, we are capable of imagining many superhuman feats, imagining that kind of suffering as a part of God's plan? No, just no. Most of the book of Hosea, the parts that I have a problem with, most of the book of Hosea actually confirms those images of the all-powerful God who could intervene and save if God chose to do so. And that's not unique to Hosea or even to the Old Testament. It's a pervasive theology throughout the whole Bible, even the Gospels. But there are moments when the biblical writers seem to acknowledge the flaws in that understanding of God. Moments when they seem to acknowledge the problems with creating God in the image of our superhuman selves. And instead, they offer alternative images, alternative theologies, even if just for eight verses. Like the one in today's reading that I was so surprised to find in Hosea of all places. In this passage, Hosea seems to say, what if instead of needing God to have superhuman powers, what if God had ordinary human powers? Like the powers, say, of a parent. Parents are very powerful, influential, formative in the lives of their children. Our experiences with our parents, for good or for ill, impact us for the rest of our lives. So yes, powerful, and definitely not all-powerful. As a parent now, I can't fathom how my parents survived that time that we experienced as a collective trauma. They must have felt so powerless. And still, they and all the other adults who helped to parent me through that time, they were immensely powerful. I'm sure they were scared and confused and muddling through the best they could. And while they couldn't save me from suffering, they did save my faith. They saved my faith by not trying to make it all better or reassure me that God had a plan. But of course, they didn't stay silent either. They also saved my faith with what they did say. They named the simple truths they did know. We love you and God loves you. This is horrible, and it's okay that it feels horrible. We don't know how you'll get through this, but you will because you are strong. And you are not alone. With those decidedly ordinary powers of love, truth, and presence, they were my superheroes. In this passage from Hosea, God, this loving, grieving, conflicted parent, can't fix everything or save everyone. But still, God, this dedicated but decidedly limited parent, does have one superpower. It's a power that every human parent hopefully strives for, but we often fall short. The power of perspective. The power to see the whole picture. The power to recognize the difficulty and the complications and name the simple but oh so powerful truth. 
And with that grand, infinite perspective, still limited, but very powerful, God says, even with all you've done, you are my child and I love you. Even with all you will do, you are my child. And again and again and again, I will say, I will still love you. I cannot do everything for you. I cannot save you from everything. But I am here. Always. And that is my superpower. To the glory of God. Amen.
You may be seated. It's part of our gathering together, part of our worship, part of our being present with God as parent is just like we might with our parent, sharing what's on our heart, sharing what's happening in our lives, sharing the things that are lifting us up and the things that are weighing us down. Friends, what are the prayers of concern or sorrow here in this number today? I have two requests. The first is um, just our community, neighbors next door. Um, this person asked for prayers, a prayer chain. She's just really praying for her grandson, Joey, who was a preemie and is struggling for life. That's Joey. For Joey, I pray. And my friend also is asking for prayers all over the country for herself, just for peace and patience and acceptance. She's still waiting for the answer from the Ninth Circuit Supreme Court on whether her case um, is going to be decided in her way. So she's just, it's been, I think, 12 years that she's been going through this, and she just wants it to be over. For Kelly, I pray. Other prayers? For all those that are being persecuted, we need to pray. For those who are experiencing persecution, we pray. For uh, Brittany Klaus, our former child caregiver here at the church, and her baby Julian and her fiance, uh, as I shared with the deacons earlier this week, uh, baby Brittany says that baby Julian, who was born at 28 weeks, I believe, um, is actually doing quite well, um, and they have they have every reason to believe that he'll continue to do well. The biggest concern is. Uh, his lungs tolerating the, the breathing support so as they continue to develop, which would be a concern for any, any infant of, of this age. Um, and if you would like to um, provide some support, we included in last week's email bulletin and will continue to do so, Brittany's information if you want to uh, offer a, a gift card for Grubhub or DoorDash or that kind of thing. They are um, not able to eat much at home these days with many trips to Swedish First Hill to the NICU there. So for Brittany, for baby Julian, for her fiance, for their um, caregivers who are caring so diligently for baby Julian when his parents can't be there, I pray. Um, prayers for my friend and colleague, Jana. Jana has been tutoring at Shoreline Community College for over 30 years. She has cerebral palsy and is in a, in a wheelchair. Her trust that kept her living independently with caregivers um, was mishandled, and her plans to move into her brother's place on Camino Island also fell through. So she's had to quit her tutoring jobs, which are giving her social life and community and purposeful work um, in order to drop her income below a level that will allow her to get Section 8 housing. For Jana, I pray. Other prayers. I add prayers for 
all those who are experiencing addiction, mental illness, those who are vulnerable and living outside or in unstable housing as weather gets colder and as the light recedes from this corner of the world for a time. And for those who are weathering, speaking of persecution, weathering bombardment threat in Gaza, for all the vulnerable in our midst, I pray. You continue with me in prayer. Holy One, we lift up to you all of these prayers, both the ones that find words and the ones that are rattling around in our hearts, in our bones, not yet finding form to syllables. God, you are our parent in so many ways, near to us. You number the stars, and you also number the hairs on the top of our heads. So in trust of this closeness, we know that you are present to us in all of these sorrows, whether we name them or not. We thank you that you're not a distant God, though sometimes it can feel distant, but a God who chose to live among us, God who chose to share in our struggles who comes alongside us, relating to us, supporting us. God, we pray that you would help us to feel that presence, help us to feel that support in this hour and every hour. And God, we thank you not only for this presence, but for moments of joy that lift us up, moments of light and connection that sustain us, give us hope of a brighter, better future. Friends, what are those prayers of joy and celebration here in this room today? I thank you all for your prayers for my surgery uh, that was on Tuesday. It all went well. And um, one of my widow friends took me and brought me back. So the only flaw in the ointment is that the surgeon discovered a second hernia that's too small to do anything about yet. So I have to go through it all again. <laughs> but hopefully it'll go as well the second time. The process is so nice, you'll do it twice. Yeah for Pat and her recovery and her care team that it went smoothly. Give thanks to God. Other prayers of joy. I know it's there. I'd like to give a prayer of joy for that sermon. for the witness and talents of Stacy, and give thanks to God. I think Betty's home. Is she home? She's supposed to come home on Friday. There she is. She is home and she's enjoying her kitties very much right now. For for Betty's return home after a long recovery and for reunion with Ella and Cinder, I give thanks to God. And my dad is turning eighty um, this Saturday. For Abby's dad on his 80th birthday, I give thanks to God. I should have mentioned this during concerns. We had an election here in the city uh, over last week. And although there were some hazards that led to the counting taking a little longer than it was supposed to, uh, it's very likely we'll have quite a lot of new council members. And so for our incoming legislators and for our outgoing legislators, for their public service and for those who support them in serving the community that we all either live in or work in or worship in, that they might be 
strengthened and served by the Spirit, that they would serve God's people well, and for their bravery and courage in stepping forward. I give thanks to God. Um, and I think this was the first year that um, regarding the elections, when I'm filling out my ballot, that I was so grateful that we do this. Just the process of it, because it's been, or feels threatened. So it makes me just appreciate Mark and my, my little choices and that it matters. For the freedom and privilege. Oh, okay. Can't wait. Here, let's take off your sandy boots. Everything about her is sandy. Um, for the freedom and privilege to choose our leaders and those who serve in office, I give thanks to God. Other prayers? Uh, as, as many people know, Sue goes up on Fridays and spends Friday afternoon and Saturday morning helping uh, take care of her mom who has dementia. And it's, it's not a disease that, that ever takes steps back, it only progresses. And so that has been rough, it gets harder and harder. But then all of a sudden, Betty, Sue's mom, will come down and sit next to Sue who she didn't know when she arrived and say, thank you for coming today. I, I, you make me happy when you're here. So there's these little nuggets, maybe three of them over 30 hours that she's there each week. Um, so it, it's not an overall gladness, but there's moments that make it. So for that, I pray. For the nuggets of gladness. I give thanks to God. I want to give thanks for the presence of some of the members of St. John's United Lutheran in worship with us again today. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the council at St. John's United Lutheran, that which is like their session, wrote a letter to our session ex um, just expressing interest in talking about ways that we might partner together. Um, perhaps very deeply, per, perhaps not, but knowing that we're asking a lot of the same big questions about how do we be church in this time and place here on Finney Ridge, and knowing that we have a lot of common values and heart for the gospel and for the community. So I'm so glad that you're here, and we look forward to continuing conversation wherever that may lead. I give thanks to God. Other prayers? I know there are many joys in our hearts on the Sunday morning, but assuming that perhaps it'll be a more fitting way to honor those joys if we continue in prayer together using the prayer that Christ taught us as printed in our bulletins. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, in a moment here, we're going to be receiving musical offerings from members of our choir and from our minister of music. And as that's happening, a, a plate will go by. Uh, if you'd like to, you can put something into it. But whether you're putting something into it, I want to invite you to, to notice that plate, to reach out, to hold it, to touch it. If you're on Zoom, to, to reach out with your actual hand or use the raise hand button. And that's because it, each of us contributing of our time, our talent, and yes, our treasure, sustain what God is doing here in this place. Friends, as God has given us, may we freely return in service of God's kingdom. Amen.
friends, with words, music, acts of service and prayer, we offer our gifts to you, Holy One. We pray that you would take each gift, that we would take each giver, that you would bless them, sanctify them, that you would use them for the building up of your kingdom in this world. May it be so. Amen. Let's put it over here. As part of sharing our time, our talent, and our treasure, part of sharing with each other as church, is when there are things happening, opportunities to serve, that we tell each other about them. And folks already know the drill. You have an announcement lying up on the side of the table. Uh, yes, Friday, uh, I emailed out to uh, everyone their statement for July through, through the end of October. Um, and if you didn't get it or you would like a hard copy, uh, let me know. Uh, we have a new system and it works wonderfully. Um, although there have been some snafus, uh, a lot of transition uh, over the last three months. So if there is an error, if there's something that needs to be corrected, let me know and we will get it fixed. One of the things you do need to know is Sunday morning offering in the plate gets recorded on the on the Monday at the Sunday date. If you give online, it is all consolidated at the end of the month. So you will see an end of the month date for your giving uh, if you give online. So contact me if you have questions and thank you for your patience as we implement the new system and people. Um, Advent's right around the corner and we'll be doing the Holden evening prayer services again. Uh, we'd actually, we have two households that have volunteered to host and we are looking for one more. So if you're a household that would love to have a group of people come by on a Sunday evening, um, I believe you guys do hot chocolate and cinnamon buns or something. <laughs> I honestly have never done one of these. But anyway, uh, we'd love to have one more person do it. It's, it's a great time. I wish I could. It just doesn't work into my schedule. But anyway, um, yeah, we're looking for one more household. And so if you're interested in doing it, please contact me, and I'll get you in the schedule. Thank you. Uh, related to that, Spiritual Formation Committee met on Monday night, and all the discussion was the upcoming seasons of Advent and Christmas, the Holden evening times setting up the tree decorating the sanctuary etc so uh, it was a, a fun evening we're one of the committees that has to look down the road before christmas gets here we'll be talking about lent so um, it's good uh second announcement the black lives matter witness this afternoon from 2 to 3 30 by the high school in ballard stop by it's going to be a great afternoon who cares if there's a football game I don't even know if there is, because Liverpool played this morning. So stop by. Everybody's welcome. Well, I'm here to tell you that Leadership Visioning met on Thursday, and um, it's never what you might expect with that group. So we discussed whether the committees of session need to meet every month that perhaps some of them uh, could meet a little less frequently. And this came about because one of our committee members was at the dinner, she was the only one, uh, with uh, Northminster and discovered that they have a, only one committee that meets monthly, the rest all meet quarterly or less. So um, we, um, would like to have the different committees discuss this idea. And so we're asking that at our session meeting. And then the other thing is we um, pulled the list. Um, Jean sent a couple lists and we're going to be looking for candidates for session deacons and um, the um, uh, at-large members of the Leadership Visioning Committee. So thank you very much. Thank you, June. Um, one last announcement. We were joined this morning during the education hour by my friend and colleague, Reverend Carly Meisenheimer, uh, for grief yoga. It's a lot of chair yoga, breathing, uh, just meditative work. It seemed like it was really working for everybody. And uh, she'll be back not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. In the meantime, so next Sunday, we will be continuing in that vein 
uh, with some breath work, some prayer, some, some body prayer, uh, really trying to lean into being before God in our bodies and attending to what's going on for ourselves. So I hope that you will join us next week and especially the week after when Carly returns. Now, with if there are no more announcements, let's continue in worship at the table. I want to invite our youngest members in. Perhaps I won't have a helper today, and we'll just. Oh. <laughs> now, Elliot, thank you for thank you for coming up here to help me. Now, when it's time, do you want to help me break the bread? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Not yet. Not yet, but soon. So, Elliot, I wonder if you can tell me whose table is this? Green. <laughs> That's right, it is a green table. Uh, but in addition to being green, Elliot, this table, when we gather around here for this meal, this table becomes God's table. Not ours, not mine, not Woodland Park for the Tyranny, but God's table. And when we gather around here, we remember a meal that Jesus had with his friends. Do you like to have meals with your friends? Yeah. You like to have snacks? So we're going to have a snack here at this table because we are part of the body of Christ. And Jesus had a meal with his friends. And because this is God's table, because Jesus is friends with everyone, everyone is welcome and accepted here at this table. And with assurance that we are welcome and accepted, we say to one another, God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our loving God. Now we're almost there. On the night that Jesus would be betrayed, he sat with his friends. Here's your part. He took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. You want to break it? I hold him up so everyone can see. Saying, this is my body broken for you. When you eat this, remember me. All right, you want to put him back down? In the same way, when supper was over, he took a cup and giving thanks, he passed it to them. You want to hold it over your head? Let your mom help you with that one. You can hold it. <laughs> All right. Mindy, you can hold it. Would you hold it up? Yep. Same way he took it, he passed it to him, saying, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It's poured out for you. When you drink of it, remember me. Now, oh, Elliot, you want to hold the bread up? You want to hold the bread up? Mindy, you hold the cup. Friends, will you pray with me? Send, O oh God, your Holy Spirit, that all who share in this bread and cup may be the body of Christ, may be light, life, and love in the world. In this hope and as your people, we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you both. Friends, the table is set, the meal is prepared. Come, all is ready.
as we conclude this time of worship and prepare for our congregational meeting, may we trust not in a God with superhuman power, but with the power of a loving parent, not all powerful and yet very powerful, with simple words of truth, love, presence, and perspective. Go when we do. <laughs> with peace and love to serve our God. Amen.
I believe that Dave is going to pass out a report, and as he does so, our moderator here will call us to order. So I actually want to suggest that we maybe take two minutes if people need to um, get a cup of coffee, go use the bathroom. So we've been for a while, and I want to just, while that's being passed out, this is your opportunity. been advised that it might be better to just call us into order. This is the agenda. Dave, can I get one of those? Oh, this is, I already have this. Um, this meeting is being called to order by prayer by, I'm saying all this for Judy, our, our clerk. Well, let's call it, let us pray. Holy One, as we gather to reflect on discernment, on our process, on the ways that we are being called in this moment to be church and to grow as church. God, I ask that your spirit would move not only over this meeting, over all of our processes. I've moved over the process in which we report today, and that it will continue to move in us as we go about enacting the plan that we discussed today. Holy One, you know all of our thoughts, our actions, May they honor you. Amen. Now, we don't need to elect a clerk pro tem because our clerk is here. Hey, Judy. Uh, the business today, the property of purpose team will present a report. Uh, do we have quorum? It looks like we do. Yes. Clerk is nodding. Thank you. Uh, now, the business today is that the property with purpose team will be presenting a report from the initial listening phase, note that's initial listening phase, and the answered questions from that phase, uh, and hopefully that'll be all of our business today. Dave. Thank you, and welcome on behalf of the Property with Purpose team. And as Pastor Joe just said, a uh, session recently approved that down, okay. The session recently approved the report that we just passed out. And the, the report basically does two things. It, it, uh, it gives the property with purpose team the okay to proceed to the next phase, which we'll talk about, which is called the exploratory and option development phase. And it's set today for a congregational meeting. So today's meeting, what we'd like to do is first report out to you on the results of the listening phase. And secondly, we'd like to talk about next steps. And thirdly, and most importantly, we want to get comments and questions that you might have. So that's what we were up to today. And to kick us off will be Mary Lou. Greetings, all. So just to remind you, we had listening sessions. And um, the committee got together. We had a. Um, several meetings to decide what the questions should be that we were gonna to present to the different um, groups that were meeting. And we all had the same questions. Um, we ended up having two dinners and three in-person meetings, two held on Zoom. Uh, there was at least one home visit and we invited a couple people to just write in their comments to the questions because they were not able to handle getting to a meeting. Um, a team member was the facilitator of each meeting, as well as some another team member who took the notes. All the notes, all the minutes of all your comments were written down, and they can be found in the report that's on the website. Um, so uh, you're going to hear a summary about what was discovered, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. So I'm reading from the, the what we heard part of that report. 
Uh, there's eight summaries that we, we came up with. Participants have very positive feelings for WPPC, but are concerned about its future. Uh, a general love for the worship experience here and a recognition uh, probably coming out from the, the pandemic that there's a there's a group of people that attend and a group of people that watch on zoom and there's a concern that some aren't listened to. Um, there's a strong desire to remain together as a congregation with a physical space to come it, it didn't really matter where we worshipped we just wanted to worship together. COVID had a major impact on us. Loss of a sense of community, um, separation between, like I said, those who attended right after COVID, those who, who came back right away, and those who, who couldn't come back right away. WPPC's mission statement is a good one, but is considered more aspirational. It reflects our values, but there's a recognition that more needs to be done. What does it mean to be a Matthew 25 church? Our building should be more aligned with our mission. We should think more about stewardship of our building than just ownership. There are lots of concerns about being able to maintain our building. Words like scary and anxious and concerned. The financial conditions came up, the financial position of the church was a common theme through those discussions. There was a good deal of openness and flexibility with thinking about the future, considering different options to how best use our building and the property that it's on, and a desire to, to get professional experience involved as soon as we could to help us make those, guide those decisions. The process so far has been viewed positively, and we want to work together to determine where we are going. And it involves both the congregation and the community around us. Jesus. Thank you, Todd, for reviewing the points we heard in the meetings. From those points, the PWP committee has come to some conclusions. Uh, first is that we like who we are as a family of faith and want to stay, worship, and work together. That means we need to find a principal place of worship, which will be a home for our church, providing us with a place not only to worship, but a place to go out from to do our work as a church. The second conclusion that we recognize that we face serious challenges. These challenges include our decreasing membership, which is increasing, by the way, our limited resources and our aging building. We recognize that we need to change and are willing to make those changes. We are willing to go through a discernment process of looking for God's guidance for the future of our church and body. The third and last conclusion we draw is that we should be open to pursuing partnerships with other churches and nonprofits, including finding opportunities for the use of our property that better aligns with our mission. Our further exploration process will continue to utilize these conclusions as we seek in further information about our direction and process in pursuing the future direction of our church in its building. So, what's next? Uh, the uh, Property with Purpose Committee uh, has the approval of session to move forward with a four-phase process to map out a plan for the future of WPPC. Phase one, our initial listening session about your thoughts and dreams for WPPC has been completed and you have the report. So where do we go from here? Four phases. Phase two will have two parts. And uh, the first part is to, as 
uh, Dave alluded to, will be explore the possibilities and the needs of this congregation by reaching out to our neighbors, churches in similar circumstances, other possible partners. This phase has already begun. The PWP team has met with uh, St. John's United Lutheran and some people from Northminster Presbyterian. And as you heard this morning, the session will be meeting with St. John's later this month um, to see if this, the synergies of our ministry on the rich. We are tapping into other resources as well. In particular, at this point, the Church Council of Greater Seattle to help us identify options and possible partners going forward. Many of you met E when they were here a few months ago. The second phase will be evaluating all of the options that we uh, explore in the first part of this phase. And then in consultation with the session and the congregation, choose an option to move forward with. Throughout the phase, we will be consulting with the session and the congregation about our findings and progress. We expect this phase to take 12 to 18 months. This is not something we are rushing into, and we will do it with deliberation and consultation. Phase three uh, will be planning to implement the option that has been chosen by uh, the session and the congregation. Defining the and addressing the obstacles and costs and working partners for uh, moving forward with the plan. And phase four will be the execution of the plan developed in phase three. These last two phases are less defined and will become more defined as we move forward. Now, finally, to summarize. Thanks, Judy. So before we, I just want to spend a little bit more time on the exploratory and option development phase that Judy was just talking about. But before I do that, I just want to say on behalf of the team, thank you to all the congregation for your participation in the listening phase. I think we were thrilled, I would say amazed by the quality of, of the comments we got, the honesty, uh, the vulnerability, the enthusiasm, the candor, uh, the ideas. Uh, we were thrilled. So thank you very much for your participation in the listening phase. And as we said, we're going to keep listening. As we work through these phases, we're going to keep looping back and, and bringing you up to date and getting your ideas before we go on again. So we'll, we'll go forward and we'll come back and we'll go forward, that kind of process. A little bit more about the exploratory phase. Um, the first thing we're going to do is reach out to the community. And what does that mean? Well, to residents, uh, neighbors around here. And if you live in, around here or you have friends or, that do live around here, we would love to get contact with them and meet with them and maybe meet with some of their friends and local businesses and talk with them. Other churches, we've met, mentioned St. John and North Minister, but uh, the Methodists down the road, there's other churches, talk with them about what their ideas are. For example, the Methodist Church, we believe, is going through a process similar to ours. In fact, they're a little bit ahead of us, so maybe we can learn from them. Social service agencies in the community, what do they see as the needs? Uh, learn from them. And talk with the Presbytery, thriving congregations, and the like, to, to get a sense of what they think the needs are. So the questions that we're going to ask of all of them are, what, are the, what, do we, what do you think are the community needs? What do you think could be some possible ideas for the use of this property? And do they see opportunities and partnerships that we ought to pursue? Well, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking with them about. And again, if you have ideas along the way, if you have suggestions who, uh, who we should be talking with, please let us know and, and we'll reach out to them. Okay? That's what the next phase is going to look like. As, as Judy uh, as, as said, it could be a long one, uh, maybe 12 to 18 months, depending on what we're here. Okay. Stay tuned for that phase. So now, we'd like to uh, open it up for comments, uh, questions that you might have, things that you think we ought to be Let's open it up. So, and all the team here.
were prepared to respond to the Sure. One question is, um, in looking at the uh, sheets of the results of the meetings yeah. for the various meetings, I've noticed that there is uh, some things that might not be on there. Okay. And uh, so what is the process to add those, yeah. to suggest those again? Yeah, we would welcome them. And please, you can contact me or any of the team, and we'll be sure to include that. So we, we tried our best to get all the comments. Sometimes, you know, lots of people were talking and we were writing, so we might have missed something. So we'd love to get those comments. It's also, just if I could jump in, uh, one of our, our adjustments right before presenting this to the congregation was renaming this from listening phase to initial listening phase to right. highlight that uh, while we wanted to have a listening phase before we launched into these other parts, we're going to be continuing to come back to the congregation to listen, to get new feedback, not just on what we're generating from these other phases, but to stay true to that, that mission. Very much so. I have a question. Are those of us that aren't able to attend the meetings or whatever going to be able to get copies of the paperwork that's been distributed to other people, like the paperwork that's been distributed to today? Right. Uh, our, our goal is to put all of our information on our web on the church's website. And so if you go there now, everything that we've done to date, including the report and the notes from the listening sessions, are all on the website. And so we'll continue to do that as we meet uh, with uh, people in the community and, and we generate reports and ideas. We're going to be uh, reporting to the session about how that's going, and we'll be posting it on our website. So that. It, we're going to drive everyone to our website, and that's where all the information is going to be. And if you, any follow-up questions, please contact any of us, and we'd be glad to chat some more. Uh, Judy, uh, okay, so conclusions. Uh, number two, we recognize that we face serious challenges. Maintaining the status quo is not sustainable. Change is needed. Now, according to your schedule, it could take three years to figure this out. Do we actually have three years to figure this out? Yeah. I mean, St. John's, it looks to me like they're going to go, they're going to be done next year. And are we really talking to them seriously or? Anyway. We, we've had some initial conversations with St. John and, and North Minister, and those will, will be ongoing. But we, we wanted to be uh, kind of very candid and realistic about how long we think this may take. Now, if for some reason things come together sooner, that would be a nice problem to have. We would be re reporting to you and we'd be moving sooner. So, but. When we're talking about potential partnerships with congregations, potential use of this property, it takes time, and we want to be realistic about that and not overpromise. Probably not, and just going to say that as the person who's leaving, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I just want to chime in and say that not every decision that faces this congregation has to happen at the same time, okay? And so you might end up making some decisions that have to do with your life together as a congregation that are more related directly to how you worship, how your staffing is structured, um, in conversation with other congregations or on your own. That might happen sooner than the process that that it will likely take to uh, make significantly different decisions about use of the building. And that's just one possible 
possible scenario. No decision has been made about that. But I just wanna say that there's multiple parts of what we're talking about here and not all of them have to happen on the same timeline. Yeah, I, I would like to reiterate what Stacy said uh, and to look at this group is looking at the property and how we might use the property. Um, session also has a part to play in some of the things Stacy has talked about in terms of are we ongoing? What are the decisions we might make in other areas that do not directly involve the building? So I think, as she said, we're, we're looking at, this committee is looking at how do we use our building? It doesn't mean there aren't other decisions that will be in the, in, in the realm of session decisions as to how we move forward in other, in other ways. Are we gonna be able to maintain our financial stability for 2024, 2025? So the answer to that question is, it depends on what happens to the building. If there's an earthquake that happens right underneath the building, the answer to that is it's gonna be really tough and it's gonna depend on what kind of insurance results. Um, but barring some kind of act of God, Yes. Not, not even somehow. There, there's plenty of money for the 2024, 2025, 2026 budget where we're not in that bad of shape. It's more about if a very, very expensive building expense suddenly comes due, that would change the picture. But we're, we're not in imminent danger of closing. I want to be clear on that. Also, just from session, I'm coming from session that we're waiting to see what the pledges are for this year, and then we'll live within our means. You know, if if pledges are a certain situation, then we're going to have to adjust the budget. Um, we do have some reserves to last that we can draw in from, but we don't want to. So we're trying to live within our means. We're really hoping that people can sooner rather than later give the pledges so we, the session can move forward. So we're just waiting for all the pledges to come through which is a plug from the stewardship committee. If you haven't gotten your pledges in, please do so, so that the session, the session can make decisions for next year. Other comments, questions at this point? The only thing I wanna add maybe, uh, not really a question so much as a comment, uh, to speaking in the direction that we're asking, uh, Stacy already sort of says, I just want to try to get my own spin on it. There's a number of questions facing this congregation. And as he said, some of those questions are going to come to answers at different points in time. Uh, any kind of uh, partnership with another congregation will be a response to one kind of problem, but it's not going to be an answer to all the questions that the PWP is considering. Uh, and one of the biggest ones is how are we going to be connecting to, relating to, interacting with, mattering to our neighbors. Um, and the, the short answer to that is while the Property with Purpose team can lead and try to offer a vision that we can follow, that vision will succeed or fail on the strength of the efforts of all of you, right? Five people on the PWP and pastors can't carry this vision. It's gonna take all of this congregation reaching out to our neighbors, reaching out to other institutions in and around Seattle to form partnerships. And partnerships doesn't mean that we're, we have to have a, a do it goal, that we have to have a thing. It can also just mean that we're being in community with each other, right? That we're, that we're being together and that by being together, by being in communication that we'll, we'll know each other better. And when something emerges, We'll be ready to act. You can't act if you don't if you don't know the partners on the scene, and that's that's part of the challenge that's facing us is is getting more connected to our community in all kinds of ways. Uh, Dave, I'm stepping on your bit. Now, moving along in the meeting, no one has told me that there's any other new business, and since there isn't any other new business, I want to ask that we have a, a motion to adjourn. 
Is there a motion to adjourn? Pat has moved. Is there a second? Roberta is second. All right. All in favor of adjourning? Can I see those hands or eyes? Opposed? This is unanimous. Let the clerk note that. I'm going to adjourn us in prayer, but I'd like all of you to pray with me, and I'd like you to rise as you are able. We're going to do a body prayer. This thing that we're talking about, this property with purpose plan that we're talking about, isn't just going to happen in our head. It's going to happen out on the street. It's going to happen in our neighbors' homes, porches, cars. Sometimes you have a conversation in the car, you get a ride. It's going to happen with our bodies being present to one another. So just like we were present in our bodies this morning, I want to be present in our bodies right now. So I want everyone to just take a second and loosen up their shoulders. Because what we're getting ready for is going to, it's going to take some gumption. It's going to take some movement. Dave, you're not moving. <sighs> Friends, will you pray with me? Holy One, I, we're reaching out to you in prayer today that you would bless our efforts, that you would bless our hearts, that you would guide our steps. And friends, I'm talking to all of you now, if you would reach out with me, I want to ask God to bless our hands as they reach out to the world around us. God, that they might reach out and touch our neighbors and join them in friendship and connection. God, I want to ask you would bless our shoulders. God, you would bless our shoulders that are that are carrying the weights of responsibilities here in this place, but also being shoulders that our neighbors can lean on to talk about their lives, their struggles. God, I want to ask you to bless our feet. Stomp, 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 that they would carry us where we need to go, to our friends' porches, out into the world. God, I want to ask you to bless our hips, that they would always be ready to dance in celebration. God, I want to ask that you would bless our ears, that they would always be ready to hear, to listen deeply to your spirit moving in our heart and the voices of those around us. And lastly, God, I want to ask that you would bless our own hearts, that they would always be following after you, that they would lead us true the path of discernment, service, connection, and shalom. Friends, go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. Mary Lou had a name for it, I forgot what it was. Mary Lou, what did you call that?